Hello, my name is Dr. Pamela Young. I work for the Australian Center for Microscopy and Microanalysis, and today I'm going to be talking to you about actual microscopes. Quick overview, I will be uh, begin by talking about bright field microscopes, um, and then I'll talk about fluorescence microscopes, confocal microscopes, and some advanced fluorescence techniques. So now I've talked a little bit about bright field microscopy, a lot about fluorescence microscopy, and now I'm going to go into all the nitty-gritty details about confocal microscopy. This is um, a picture of one of my favorite confocal microscopes. This is my Nikon C2. Um, it's your basic confocal microscope. You can see the scanner uh, located on top of the microscope where a camera would typically live. Um, and then uh, next to the microscope is the laser box. So, and on the screen there is one of my favorite kidney, kidney sections. Um, so the light path of the microscope, from that image of the microscope, it's very difficult to tell where, what that light path is, right? It's a bunch of cables back behind. You can't really see the light path of the microscope. So I'm, I'm just going to give you a little schematic. So here is a very, very basic schematic of a confocal microscope. Um, you can see uh, that we've got a laser um, as our light source directing light through a beam splitter. That's the same as you know, the dichroic mirror filter cube that we talked about earlier. Um, through the objective lens, um, and then you can see that it's still exciting uh, throughout that full volume, um, just like a wide field microscope. Um, however, um, as the light then passes back up through the objective, that fl those fluorescence emissions, um, instead of passing through the beam splitter, they get bent, just like a fluorescence microscope, but those out-of-focus um, planes get blocked by that confocal pinhole, and only the light from the focal plane is then um, allowed to reach that PMT detector. So things that we have to consider, uh, the lasers, the delivery system for the laser light, uh, the scanning mirrors, the detection pinhole, splitting the signal to different detectors, and then detecting that signal. So I'm going to talk about each of these components, just like I did with the fluorescence microscope. I'm going to start with the lasers. So the laser is that light source right there at the top of my schematic. There are many, many different lasers available. Um, so it's just a very, very intense, coherent, monochromatic source of light. Uh, so instead of a white light source like we use in um, fluorescence microscopy or even bright field microscopy, uh, this is just going to be a single wavelength typically. Um, and then um, that uh, single you know, coherent light source will be expanded to fill that back aperture. Um, or it can be focused down to a very, very, very small point of light, and that's what we need for that scanning. Um, laser beams are typically linearly polarized. I'm not going to spend much time talking about the polarization of the lasers. Uh, so what are some typical lasers that are available? Uh, the gas argon um, that has multiple laser lines that you can pick off from the um, an argon laser. Uh, typically, people use the 488 and the 514. Occasionally, people use the 453 and the 476. Um, there's an argon krypton laser that you can uh, purchase, just the krypton laser. Um, more and more common now are just getting little diode lasers um, that are just single single wavelength diode lasers. So, um, you know, a 440 or a 480 or a 640, um, a 405 for your your DAPI probes. Um, the helium neon for those farther red probes, uh, the 633 line. Um, there are also um, some uh, the tunable Thai sapphire lasers. Those are if you're doing a technique called multi-photon microscopy, which I'm not going to spend much time during this talk on, but I will mention briefly at the end, um, which gives you those um, uh, far red into the infrared wavelengths. Uh, this is a really neat laser because you can actually tune the wavelength um, between typically around 700, and we actually have one that goes out to 1300 nanometers. Um, so you can actually dial in the wavelength that you want. It isn't just um, a single laser line. Um, however, you can't like broaden it. You can't say I want you know a wavelength range of 800 to 850. You kind of have to choose 800. It's still a very, very narrow monochromatic source. 
um, and some UV lasers. And then I thought I had added on here, which I might go back and do. Um, now there are also white light lasers that are available that similar to that Thai Sapphire laser, uh, you can tune, but between um, like 470 and 670 is, is kind of the range. Again, you can pick a single laser line. Um, you can't choose like a range of wavelengths like you would using, you know, an a excitation filter in um, fluorescence microscopy. So I really like this chart um, for helping you choose the right laser for your fluorophores. Um, as you can see here, uh, let's just start at the top with Alexa Fluor 405. It's got an excitation peak around 401. Um, and so we've stated that the optimal laser line is probably going to be your 405 laser. Um, we've listed a few typical laser lines here that you can purchase. Um, you can see that the 405 laser line gives you about 96% excitation efficiency, while the next uh, wavelength of 442 uh, will gives you zero and even if you were to get the white light laser that I think typically goes down to about 470 nanometers you're still not going to get any excitation um, of your Alexa Fluor 405 probe and then uh, if you look at something like DAPI um, again we say the optimal laser line is 405 even though it only gives us about 10 percent excitation efficiency and that's because its excitation peak is around 359 and we don't typically use UV lasers in confocal microscopy um, because the optics required to pass those UV lasers are just very expensive. Um, once you get below you know 405 um, uh, glass just doesn't pass the wavelengths terribly well so you've got to be a little bit cautious with that. Um, so please look over this chart at your leisure. Um, I find it very, very useful for helping you to determine which laser is most useful um, for your fluorophores of interest. And of course, you can always talk to the team when you're um, trying to decide what would be the best fluorophore for your purposes uh, based on what lasers we have. So in addition to choosing um, your laser line, you're also going to need a way to control your laser power. Um, obviously, you don't want... Um, you know, 100 milliwatt laser uh, shining right on your cells. So um, there are three typical ways we control our laser power. Um, neutral density filters uh, can be put in place to cut down that laser power. Um, and uh, AOM or AOTF, the acousto optic modulator or acousto optic tunable filter, um, and an EOM, an electro optic modulator, also known as a POCL cell. Um, those are good because they allow you know a continuous tuning from zero to 100 percent as opposed to a discrete step like you would have with a, a neutral density filter. Um, the EOM is particularly useful if you need to do fast switching um, or like beam blanking. So neutral density filters look a little bit like this. Typically you have um, uh, you can either have like a single neutral density filter that you can slide into place or you might have a few on a filter wheel or you might have a graded neutral density filter wheel um, that you can uh, tune, turn very specifically to uh, to block out exactly the, the right amount of light. However, these are not fast enough for beam blanking um, during retrace, uh, which means you're going to have um, a lot of laser on your sample when you aren't necessarily you know, c collecting any um, any of that signal uh, at your photomultiplier tube for um, uh, to create the image, um, and so you'll get extra photo bleaching um, if you don't have a good way to 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 blank that beam um, during your scanning uh, retrace. So that means we typically prefer to use something like an acousto optic modulator or an acousto optic tunable filter. So an acousto optic modulator. Um, adjust that laser intensity using um, optical effects of an acoustic field on a biofringent crystal. Um, so by inputting some um, radio frequency waves onto this biofringent crystal, we're going to affect the local density of the crystal um, and therefore the refractive index. Um, so light passing through the crystal is diffracted at an angle depending on the wavelength of light and the frequency of the acoustic wave. Um, and the amplitude of this acoustic wave is what determines the intensity of that deflected beam and can be varied between 0 and 85 percent. Um, so you can basically uh, switch on and off your laser very, very quickly. This works very well for beam blanking. Um, and you can switch it on to, um, you know, whatever particular laser power that you need. Maybe you only need 10 percent 
of that full laser power. So in like the example of a hundred milliwatt laser, maybe you only need 10 milliwatts of laser power. So you can turn it on at quote 10%. Um, so uh, this is also very useful uh, to use um, uh, an acousto optic uh, tunable filter, um, which is the, the very close cousin of the AOM. Um, if you want to use multiple laser lines simultaneously or possibly sequentially. Um, so an AOM works with one laser line. Uh, an AOTF can be used with multiple laser lines, um, basically as a filter to select um, the single wavelengths of an oncoming light. Um, so um, again, it's controlled by a radio frequency that you apply uh, to the AOTF. Um, and you can actually use multiple frequencies at the same time. So maybe you want to, um, uh, you know, line scan your image with the, you know, 442 nanometer laser for a line and then do the same line again with the 514 laser and then the same line again with the 568 laser. Um, so the lasers will all be turned on simultaneously um, and then the AOTF will control those laser lines coming on and off at that very, very fast rate. Um, or maybe you want to sign, you know, like the 442 and the 568 simultaneously. Um, and then you can just use um, multiple detectors to, to split out your, your images um, on the emission side. Um, and then just excite with the 514 uh, sequentially. So I'm going to talk a lot more about scanning sequentially laser later. Um, but just know that this AOTF uh, is what you're going to need in order to be able to flick those lasers on and off um, very, very quickly and control, control those lasers. Uh, the other um, laser intensity control option that I mentioned is the electro-optic modulator or apocal cell. Again, this uses a biorefringent uh, crystal um, that we um, uh, will change the, um, the crystal's properties using an electric field as opposed to a um, uh, radio frequencies or an acousto-optical field. Um, so basically, you apply a voltage to your crystal and the crystal will um, pass some percentage of your laser and it will deflect some percentage of your laser. And so by varying that voltage, um, that's how you modulate what percentage of the light passes through the crystal and what percentage of the light gets deflected. Um, this can be done very, very quickly. It works very, very well for beam blanking and it's probably the most common um, way to adjust your intensities uh, for like multi-photon microscopy. Um, so yeah, so this, you know, you really need this, this rapid switching for, for that flyback beam blanking when you're doing your, doing your scanning. Um, cause although you can scan your raster scan in both directions, a bi-directional scan, um, that can have, uh, some problems associated with it. Um, including, you know, getting your image to line up just right. You have to kind of play with, uh, your phase angle a little bit. So more commonly, you will just scan in, you know, like the left to right direction. And then on your flyback coming right to left, left, you blank your beam. Um, and then you'll start again and, and, and collect your image uh, from right to left um, and repeat. This is also very important if you want to do any sort of region of interest scanning. Um, so a lot of microscopes will offer you the ability to just scan a specific region or maybe just select a specific region to shine very high intensity, maybe 405 light on if you want to do some sort of photo activation or photo uncaging. Um, so that can be very, very useful if you just want to choose a specific area. Also for like a FRAP experiment, if you just want to photo bleach a very specific region in the image and then watch that floor for travel back into that area, um, you need the ability to do that, that ROI scanning. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, doing a, you know, any sort of sequential scanning, if you want to scan your blue laser followed by your green laser, followed by your red laser to make sure that you're really minimizing any sort of um, crosstalk between your different fluorophores, um, it's important that you be able to do that, that type of sequential scanning. So you really need to be able to have a tight control over when that laser is on and exciting your sample and when it is not on. All right, so um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about filters and AOBS. Uh, and so that's how we um, will actually control, just like in a fluorescence microscope, uh, the wavelength of light that comes to the sample, as well as the wavelength of light coming from the sample going to that detector.
So here I just call it a very basic beam splitter. Because you're using lasers, you very rarely need an excitation filter, um, but you do sometimes. You you will you will need that dichroma, uh, dichromatic mirror um, in order to um, get your light to the sample uh, separate from the emissions from your sample that you want to come back to uh, your your detector. So. Um, we typically use, uh, you know, your standard dichroic mirrors, a single, a double, or a triple, like I talked about with fluorescence microscopy. Um, but often in confocal microscopy, we prefer to use a AOBS, acousto-optical beam splitter, um, which allows continuous tuning from uh, zero to 100 um, percent, and it replaces the dichroic mirror. I'm going to talk about both of these here. So, um, I, you know, I showed you this dichroic, this triple dichroic um, earlier when I was talking about fluorescence microscopy. But you can see it wastes a lot of your emission spectrum um, because we're we're only shining that 488 nanometer light very specifically from the laser. Uh, we don't need that broad um, that broad range of of wavelengths to be able to to pass through the dichroic mirror. We really just need to be able to pass 488. Um, and therefore, you know, 487 and 489, uh, we're very happy to come back to um, our detector and be collected as fluorescence emissions. So we really prefer to use these acousto-optical beam splitters um, because we're able to get so much more specific with the wavelength of light that we're passing and the wavelength of light that um, is able to then go back to the detector. Uh, they're able to deflect about eight laser lines simultaneously. Um, so if you do want to do simultaneous scanning with multiple laser lines, you can do that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's very nice because you are be able to be very, very specific. So here's an example of that. So that same triple dichroic from before, but then the AOBS's transmission curve, you can see very, very specific um, for those, those three laser lines. Um, and therefore, we're able to capture a lot more, a lot more of that emission. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about scanning mirrors. So um, in common confocal systems, I'm mostly going to focus on our point scanning systems here. Um, I'm going to mention a little bit at the end disk scanning. Um, I'm not really going to spend any time on line scanning or swept field, um, but for, for the sake of this um, talk, I'm really going to focus on, on our point scanning systems. So these are the ones that, you know, raster scan your image in the order of, you know, maybe as fast as 10 frames per second, more often one frame per second. It's fairly typical. So in a typical point scanning system, it's got a set of um, galvo mirrors that are used to um, walk the beam across the sample in a raster scan pattern. Uh, so one scanning mirror is going to move very quickly to move um, that laser beam, let's say, across the sample in X, and then the second mirror will drop it down in Y. Um, so it'll walk very fast across an X, and then the second mirror drops it in Y, and then it walks very fast across an X, and then the second mirror drops it in Y, and repeat for your raster scanning uh, pattern. Um, some of the advantages of this is that you get very good spatial resolution. Um, you've got a lot of flexibility in scanning. You can speed up and slow down your scan speed. You have a lot of control over that. So if you want to spend more time on each pixel, you just slow down your scan speed. Um, typical times are you know two, maybe four microseconds per pixel. But you can slow that right down, spend 12 microseconds on each pixel if you need to, to capture more light, to get more signal. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility there. Um, you can also park the beam if you need to. Um, and this, this system really does a great job you know, quote unquote, maximizing the confocal effect. You get the best resolution in this type of uh, point scanning system. Uh, some of the disadvantages is it can be fairly, fairly slow. Um, you typically get around one frame per second uh, for a 512 by 512 image. Um, it's fairly fairly typical scan speeds or or even slower. Um, if you're doing you know, a larger image of 1024 by 1024, it might take you four seconds to capture a single image. So it's not going to really be ideal if you're trying to look at something very dynamic. And also you're going to see a high level of photo bleaching um, because you've got you know a lot of laser just sitting on your sample for a fairly long period of time. But if you have fairly robust samples, um, you're going to get the nicest, highest resolution images this way. Uh, the second type of scanner is the resonant scanner. And so what the resonant scanner does is, a, as opposed to doing your typical raster scan, um, it's going to kind of vibrate the mirror in this, causing the laser beam to move in this kind of sinusoidal scan pattern. 
um, which means that you're going to be able to image much, much more quickly. It allows very fast line scanning. Um, and so you're able to get more like 10 frames per second where you would get one frame out of a, um, out of a Galvo system. Uh, some of the problems will be your scan linearity. You've got to do some sort of post-processing tricks to make sure that your image is still nice and flat. Um, but those have been fairly well worked out and established now that you can get really, really nice images out of your resonance scanners um, at that, that you know, much faster 10 frames per second speed, which is fantastic. Um, you'll typically run these in a, in a bi-directional scanning. So instead of just scanning, you know, left to right, you do that, that sinusoidal uh, pattern. Um, and so you aren't going to have any laser light that's just sort of, um, uh, you know, on the sample, but not being used for something. Um, so it's got um, uh, the downside of that, obviously, being that you do have to make sure that your your image you know lines up with itself really, really nicely. Um, but as I mentioned, most systems these days have worked that out really, really well. Um, a lot of times you are restricted to a very specific scan area. You can't you know zoom in, you can't really pan or rotate. Um, you you're kind of restricted to you know this resonance scanner works at 512 by 512, you know, full stop. That's that's all you can kind of do with it. You can't do 1024 by 1024. You can't do, um, you know, slow down from you know two microsecond per pixel dwell time to four microsecond per pixel dwell time. You're kind of stuck with this is what the resonance scanner can do. So this is what you have to do. But um, uh, you know, we found some ways to work around that as well by averaging frames and things. So I find that the resonance scanners really can. Um, have become a very powerful tool uh, for those, you know, getting nice images that are that are fairly quickly. So I've mentioned here a couple times different scan sizes. Um, so if you're used to working with a camera, you might not be very very familiar with this concept. But um, so so with a camera where you have you know kind of a static chip size and really the only way you can change the number of pixels is doing a bit of binning, um, you can actually you know, scan the exact same area, the same field of view with kind of whatever number of pixels that you want, especially with like, like I said, with a Galvo scanning system. So what you can see here is um, we captured four images for you um, using a 40x objective. Um, and the first image in the upper right was at 256 by 256 pixel resolution. Um, and so that gives me a pixel size, if I were to measure it with a stage micrometer, of about 1.24 microns. Um, and then I captured the same image again. I didn't. I had Courtney do it <laughs> um, at 512 by 512 pixels. So I cut my pixel size in half, 0 0.62 microns per pixel. Now, you're probably thinking the image looks pretty darn similar, and I agree with you. Um, at this, you know, kind of zoomed out view on my screen here, it looks very similar. Uh, but when I zoom in, you'll see the difference. Um, and then so we also did it with 1024 by 1024. So we cut that pixel size in half again, 0 0.31 and 2048 by 2048 cutting our pixel size again down to 0 0.155 microns. So now if I just choose an area to zoom in, like this little spot here, um, what you can see is in that upper right where our pixel size is 1.24 microns, you see a very pixelated image. Um, and then obviously by cutting the pixel size in half for the 512 by 512 image, um, we get um, a much less pixelated image, although it's still quite pixelated. Um, and then cutting again for the 1024 by 1024 in the bottom left, pixel size of 0 0.31, the image looks even nicer. Um, and then by the time we go up to that 2048 by 2048 with a pixel size of 0 0.155, um, you see the least amount of pixelation. So this, um, this brings us to where you're going to spend a lot more time thinking about things like Nyquist sampling because you're going to have so much more control on the confocal microscope of your pixel size. You really get to kind of choose what your pixel size is. You can either choose um, a different number of total pixels for the image or you can actually do what's called a digital zoom into an area and just image a smaller area than the full field of view that like your 10 or your 40x would give you. So here's an example to illustrate digital zooming. Um, so you can see on the left the full field of view with the 10x objective. Um, I have a pixel size of about 1.24 microns for um, an image size of 1024 by 1024 pixels. Um, and then if I dial in to my microscope to do a digital zoom of 2, um, still using the 10x objective, 
uh, still capturing 1024 by 1024 pixels, my pixel size then drops down to 0 0.62 microns. Um, so you're able to really kind of um, dial in exactly the Nyquist resolution that you need uh, to get the, um, the image quality uh, for your uh, sample, for your image, for your analysis. And that can be really, really powerful and useful because maybe you just um, need a, a low res 10x image, a pixel size of 1.24 is fine because you're looking at very large features. You're able to collect your image fairly quickly then um, and you're able to, you know, keep um, a small amount of light on the sample while you know if you in, if you do need you know that more more detail you need that higher sampling rate because you're looking at some smaller features you want to take advantage of um, you know your full na of the objective um, then you might want to do some some digital zooming and, and spread those pixels over a smaller area so this is what it will typically look like in your microscope software, something like this, where you can choose how much you want to zoom in digitally um, on, on your sample. Um, you can see here that um, this software package even offers uh, a button that will calculate that Nyquist XY for you. Um, so uh, if you don't want to do the maths yourself, if your software package does not offer that, you can obviously um, do the maths yourself. Um, it's very easy. Just calculate the resolution based on the um, emission wavelength and the NA uh, of your objective, um, and then divide that by um, Nyquist, uh, which recommends that uh, 2.3 uh, sampling. So that will tell you what your ideal pixel size is, and then zoom in until you get your pixel size to that calculated value. Uh, so here in this case, the pixel, the ideal pixel size is 0 0.35 microns, and that's a digital zoom of 7.04. So now you may be wondering, why do I ever need to use anything other than my low mag 10x lens if I can just keep digitally zooming in? Well, remember, resolution isn't determined by magnification. It's determined by the numerical aperture of the objective, which I talked about quite a bit earlier. Um, and so you can keep zooming in as much as you want uh, digitally, but eventually you're going to um, come across a problem called empty magnification. So you keep magnifying, but you can't actually see any more detail because you don't have the resolution there. Um, and so uh, though you can digitally zoom in, you know, zoom of 30, you know, whatever crazy pants thing you want to do, um, at some point you're not actually going to see more detail. And you can see here in this, this image, image A, um, uh, you get a very nice resolved image at this magnification, uh, while image B, um, even though you're able to magnify it more, you aren't able to see more detail because the resolution just isn't there. So you've just done some, um, some more magnification without any more resolution, that, and we call that um, empty magnification. So up to this point, I've just talked about scanning and X and Y, but the whole point of using a confocal microscope is because you probably want to look at um, uh, some sort of thick sample that's got some out of focus blurring, right? Otherwise, you'd just be using a fluorescence microscope. You wouldn't need a confocal microscope. So what you probably want to do is um, build up a 3D image. So you capture that nice optically sectioned uh, 2D image, and then you'll move um, either the, the objective, that nose piece um, that the objective uh, is screwed into, or you'll move the stage um, physically in Z and then capture another image. So you'll physically move that foc focal plane um, over and over again to build up a stack of images. Um, and so you can see here that we've uh, captured a stack of images of this, I think it's a tick, um, and then we actually put together a projection of those images without any out-of-focus blurring because we collected them with confocal microscopy so that we can see that nice 3D image. And so what's that look like here? Um, so you can see our, our X, Y, and Z image uh, gets built up. And so if you look at the top, you know, we can just see two little lines of this kind of figure. Um, and as we capture through, then we're able to see this, this 3D object kind of, kind of within space. So this represents, you know, maybe your nucleus that you've labeled with DAPI inside some, some tissue that you're then able to kind of, um, you know, draw out uh, that information from that that thick tissue so that you can see this really, really nice um, 3D object. <laughs>
Okay, so um, we've now talked about lasers, uh, filters, and scanning. Now I'm going to talk more about objectives. You're probably wondering, Pam, how can you possibly talk more about objectives? I could talk to you about objectives all day. Uh, so again, just like in fluorescence microscopy and bright field microscopy, the objective lens is probably the most important part of your microscope. So in confocal microscopy, um, you really, really, really need to think hard about that numerical aperture. I just talked to you a little bit about sampling and about resolution, um, and that comes back to that numerical aperture. So um, in confocal microscopy, something we think about is that optical sectioning, that Z depth um, of each of our um, each of our slices. Uh, and so the numerical aperture has a very, very um, is what determines you know, how thick that optical section is going to be. So something we talk about a lot in confocal microscopy is the point spread function. And so if you were to image a very, very, very small point uh, object, so maybe a very small fluorescent bead um, or a very small vesicle perhaps within your cell, um, something smaller than the resolution of the microscope, um, the lateral resolution of the microscope, image something very, very small, uh, it's actually not going to look like just a nice little point of light, but it's going to have some rings around it, and that is due to diffraction. Um, and so when you image this very small object in X and Y, it looks like a very small point um, with a few kind of Saturn-like rings about it, I suppose. But now if I were to capture a Z stack of this very small bead, um, and so change my focus through this bead, um, and look at an XZ image, let's say. So turn the image on its side so I can see my bead from its side. It doesn't look like a nice point of light. It doesn't look like, let's say, Saturn. Um, it looks like this weird cigar shape um, that's got these, you know, sticky uppy downy rings. Um, when I did my PhD, I called them arms up and legs down. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you need to think very, very hard about the numerical aperture of your objective because that spread in Z, that axial point spread function, um, is um, is determined by um, 1.4 times the, that emission wavelength of light times the refractive index uh, that you are imaging through um, divided by the numerical aperture squared. So it's really more important than ever. So small changes in that numerical aperture are going to cause big, big, big effects in your Z distance. So I want to talk a little bit about um, that, that refractive index part of it. Um, for confocal microscopy, you can use a dry lens. You absolutely can. Um, but that does have that um, um, fairly low NA. You can't go above about 0.95 in a, in a dry lens NA. Um, while with a water lens, you'll see up to about 1.25, I think, um, NA. And with an oil lens, you can get up to about 1.48, I think, is the highest I've seen uh, NA. So if you want to get very, very good 3D resolution, very, very good Z resolution, you're going to need to start thinking about using these oil immersion or water immersion lenses. Um, now, you might be thinking, so oil's got a refractive index the same as my cover slip, so the light is going to travel very nicely through the oil, through the cover slip to my sample. Um, however, if my sample is live cells, it's in something aqueous, I want to image fairly deep into these live cells, I'm going to see a fairly um, strong bend at that change in refractive index between the cover slip and the sample. Um, or if I use a water immersion lens, I'm going to see a big bend at that water immersion cover slip interface and then again at that cover slip sample interface. Um, and that can cause some big distortions um, in your image. So objects um, will appear, um, you know, even more broadened or possibly not even in the, you know, the location that you would think it is based on the mechanical movement of the stage. Um, so some of the things that we've done to kind of correct for those issues is we try to use oil immersion objectives with samples that are mounted in something similar with similar refractive index to oil. So you can buy some very high refractive index uh, mounting media. Um, and then for like your live cells and you, where you choose you know, that water immersion lens, the water immersion lens typically has a correction column. And so 
the correction collar will actually move an extra lens element inside the um, the objective in order to compensate for that cover slip thickness. So if you know how thick your cover slip is, you know exactly how much the light is going to bend. Um, and so you can just kind of dial in the thickness of your cover slip um, right onto the front barrel of the lens. If you're using a number one and a half cover slip, um, it's going to be 170 microns thick. So you can just dial your cover, um, your correction collar to that. Um, and you can see um, in this, this table that I have here, if you have a, a very small deviation, um, it can really cause big effects in um, the amount of you know signal decrease getting um, back to the detector, as well as it can cause some really, really weird optical aberrations. Um, it's going to uh, present itself as what appears to be a spherical aberration in your image. Um, you can also use multi-immersion objectives, which can be um, very popular, um, particularly if you're going to be going from maybe a low mag lens up to a higher mag lens. Uh, you can get a low mag multi-immersion lens that will work, you know, with water or glycerol or oil. Um, you just dial in what immersion fluid you're going to be using. You can use that low mag lens then to find your sample, and then you don't need to, um, uh, you know, clean the sample, clean the lens when you switch to that, you know, that high mag oil lens. So uh, multi-immersion objectives are also very, very useful. Um, so getting the most out of your objective, but not taking more than it can give. Here's a really great chart um, that you'll find um, very useful. Now, this was obviously calculated, um, you know, kind of for a, a specific um, a specific instrument. Um, but um, the numbers are still very, very useful to think about, because if you've got, you know, a 10x objective, um, and you scan it at 512 by 512 pixels or 1024 by 1024 pixels. Uh, your scan area is going to be the same, but your pixel size is going to be different. For the 512 image, it'll be 3 microns, and for the 1024 image, you'll be half that, 1.5. The lateral resolution of the 10x isn't changing, so your Nyquist pixel size isn't changing. And so um, we've calculated for you, you know, the optimal zoom to obtain that Nyquist uh, sampling um, for the 512 by 512 images, you know, a zoom of 10, and for the 1024 by 1024 is a zoom of 5. So this is really a good way to kind of wrap your head around, um, you know, how these numbers um, affect each other. Uh, the next one is that 40x where we've got the, you know, the low NA dry lens of 0 0.75 and then a high NA oil lens of 1.25. And again, you can see how, um, how those numbers relate, how... Um, how much uh, zoom is required in order to obtain that that optimal sampling. Um, and, and we've done it as well for a 63 water and a 63 gliss. And these are all things that you can calculate yourself or things that um, uh, oftentimes the microscope software will calculate uh, for you. Um, if your software is not fancy enough to do these types of calculations for you, um, you can always just get a stage micrometer and actually do pixel size measurements. Um, you have the equations now for um, numerical aperture to resolution. Um, so these are definitely fairly easy calculations for you to do. All right, so um, now I want to move on to talk about the pinhole. The pinhole is possibly the most important part in the confocal microscope because it is what actually blocks that out of focus light. So um, it is put typically in front of that you know, that single point scanning PMT detector um, in order to um, block any sort of out of focus light and only allow the light coming from the focal plane to reach the detector. Uh, so here's a slightly better schematic, I suppose, of the pinhole. Um, it's just an iris. It's very, very simple. Um, it's got a diameter proportional to the NA of the objective. Um, and so, and where you put it, obviously, in the microscope is very important. It's got to be in a confocal plane, hence the name of the technique, confocal microscopy, um, in order to make sure that you're just blocking out of focus light. Um, so here you can see um, in this example of a, quote, adjustable pinhole, um, you can kind of choose your, your pinhole size. Um, the calculation is, um, it's referred to as an airy unit, is your optimal pinhole size, and that's calculated from um, 0.61 times the emission wavelength of light times the total magnification. Uh, so remember, if you do have an extra magnifier in front of your detector, um, you know, it's not just going to be, you know, the 60x written on your, 
um, written on your uh, objective barrel, it might be 600x, uh, and then divided by the numerical aperture. Um, now you can see when you when you open up your pinhole, um, you'll let a lot more light in, but it's going to be a lot all of that out of focus light. And as you close your pinhole down, you'll get that that better resolution. Um, you're still going to have rings. You aren't able to eliminate rings, um, but you will have um, fewer. I don't know if fewer is the right word, but the the rings will be less dramatic um, in, a, in an optimally um, sized pinhole. Okay, now I want to spend some time talking about detectors, the PMT detector. So we don't have cameras typically on um, point scanning microscopes. We use just single photodiodes, um, most often photomultiplier tubes. Um, so you can see here the quantum efficiency of um, the detectors used in confocal microscopy is actually fairly low. Um, you remember when we talked about cameras earlier, I was talking about, you know, 90, 95 percent quantum efficiency. Maybe the CMOSs were only around 70. Um, here you can see, you know, 60, 60 percent is kind of kind of the best you can expect in quantum efficiency from these detectors. Um, however, um, they are still uh, kind of the the best way to capture light. Um, uh, in confocal microscopy, there there have been constant you know advances in the different um, types of of PMTs and, and and single photon detectors available, and I'm going to talk about those. Um, and you can see here also that they're very wavelength dependent. Um, so we commonly use multi alkali detectors, which you can see have a fairly high quantum efficiency over a fairly broad visible range, um, and then falls off once you get up into the uh, near infrared. Um, gallium arsenide detectors um, are becoming more and more popular. Um, you can see they fall off once you get down around the blue, so they work very well in the green and the red and even into the, the farther red range. Um, so uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about each of those. So how does this photon detector work? So the photons hit um, the front face of the detector. Um, and then there's this multiple, uh, it gets converted to an electron and um, those electrons get multiplied up. That's why it's called a photomultiplier tube um, because um, it hits that photocathode, those photons get converted to electrons and then they are multiplied up before they are then um, uh, converted um, at that anode to a voltage. And so there are a few things that we can adjust on our detectors. Um, the gain, which is the um, amount of power that we put on that detector, um, that controls that amount of multiplication um, of those electrons. Um, and then also um, an offset or black level, um, which, uh, which will then um, you know, bring, bring up or down that, that black level from the detector, as you can see C and B in the second image. So as we turn the gain up, you can see um, how uh, in that third image, the, um, the signal intensity gets kind of multiplied and stretched um, while adjusting the offset brings that signal down to give you that good, good black level. And those are our two main detector adjustments um, when we are um, uh, imaging. So in order to make it a little bit easier for us to do those adjustments, in addition to looking at our histogram, uh, we like to turn on what's called an under overlut. Um, there are a few different under overluts out there, but basically we just want something um, to colorize our image so that we can see where the black, you know, where the black level is, those zero pixels, and where those saturated pixels are in the image. Because what you might find is, oh, you know, the thing that is saturating the detector is just a piece of dirt anyway, so I don't really care that there's a bit of saturation there. I know that that's dirt in my sample, um, and so I want to spread that dynamic range. Um, adjust the gain on the detector to spread that dynamic range across, um, you know, just the, the actual features I'm interested in, and I'll just make sure that I move my sample a little bit to get that dirt out of the field of view. Um, as you can see here, Leica um, typically uses blue for those saturated pixels and green for those, quote, undersaturated pixels or that have pixel value of zero. Um, Zeiss uses blue and red. Um, and so, and these typical, these detectors typically are around 12, 12 bit range. So usually from zero to 4,095 gray levels, although there are still in some of the older systems, eight bit detectors, zero to 255. Um, but 12 bit is kind of the most common. Um, 
And so it is fairly important that you kind of capture that full dynamic range, because typically when you're doing your image analysis, you need a few thousand gray levels to work with in order to really be able to um, do uh, to really analyze the features that you're interested in. Um, working down in the bottom, you know, a few hundred gray levels um, can cause a lot of image analysis challenges. So it's really ideal if you can use that full dynamic range. Um, but at the same time, it's important that you don't lose any features to saturation. Um, or lose any features to undersaturation. So you don't want to lose any of that dim information falling off the bottom of your um, histogram, and you don't want to lose any of that bright information falling off the top of your histogram. So it's important you look at both things, your histogram as well as uh, your image with the, um, the under overlap. Okay, so another type of uh, photo detector that's become very popular these days is called a hybrid photo detector um, or a hybrid PMT. And so the hybrid uh, PMTs are just a lot more sensitive than a PMT. Um, they use a silicon avalanche diode um, in order to uh, really um, amplify up your electrons, um, and you're able to just get a lot more signal. Um, the hybrid photo detectors that I have used typically don't have a um, um, an offset or black level adjustment because zero intensity is really zero photons. Um, uh, unlike a PMT where you can kind of move that around with a hybrid photo detector, you don't need to because zero is zero. Um, you can see that the quantum efficiency of hybrid detectors is um, a bit better than a typical PMT, um, but again, it de kind of depends on um, the wavelength as well, so it's just something to, to be aware of. Um, is um, you know, it's always gonna gonna depend on on the wavelength. The standard PMT you can see uh, will do better at kind of those those longer wavelengths. So some of the advantages of the hybrid detectors is they've got a low dark noise, um, and therefore you can use less laser, so you've got increased cell viability. Um, uh, they can run you know fairly quickly, um, although PMTs are also fairly quick. So that's um, usually it's your scanner that's going to be the the bigger issue than the detector. Um, and then also what's nice about the confocal system is you can actually throw a few detectors on. It's pretty rare that you see um, a wide field fluorescence system with multiple cameras. It's not impossible. You can have two cam systems. Um, but that means that on a wide field fluorescence system, you kind of have to capture one color at a time. Um, while on a confocal system, you can collect, you know, three or even four colors simultaneously. Um, and so you can see here in this, this little screenshot from one of my microscopes that I've got four, um, four detectors set up in, in a sequence here. Uh, channel one and channel four are standard PMTs and channel two and three are kind of those, those, um, those gas detectors. Um, so the gas detector is, is somewhere in between kind of a hybrid detector and a, um, uh, a PMT. It's got much more sensitivity, um, but it does have offset control. Um, and so you can see that in this in this diagram, um, I've got quite a few filter wheels in place so that I can um, look at many different types of fluorophores. So I can choose my first dichroic mirror. Um, I typically would use like a 405, 48, 561, 640 dichroic mirror. Um, so even higher than a triple dichroic, a quad dichroic mirror. Um, so that I can just have a single one in place and I don't have to worry about any switching. Um, and then I can turn on all four lasers simultaneously, 405, 48, 560, and 640. Um, and then I can just use filters in front of each of these detectors in order to spectrally separate my four fluorophores. Now, obviously, if you do have some crosstalk, that can be a problem, um, and you'll see things cross into each other um, each other's channels. So you do always need to check to make sure that you don't have um, any of your, you know, your DAPI crossing into your FITSI channel or anything like that. And if you do see your DAPI crossing into your FITSI channel, you might need to sacrifice time and image those two laser lines uh, sequentially. But um, it's, uh, if you can get away with doing things simultaneously, you can save yourself a lot of time. And so here's just a little bit more information explaining about simultaneous scanning and spectral overlap. So in when you do simultaneous scanning, you turn on multiple lasers simultaneously. Uh, so those fluorophores are being excited simultaneously. Um, and then you use um, uh, emission filters and dichroic mirrors in order to separate out those emissions. However, um, 
as you can see in these um, uh, fluorescence emission diagrams uh, up in the top, these graphs in the top, in A, we've got um, the alexafluor 488 emission and the alexafluor 555 emission. And what you can see is um, there's a pretty big area of spectral overlap uh, between those two. So um, you can't really put a, a good... Um, uh, a good filter combination uh, in to actually get good spectral separation between those two. Um, and then obviously by just um, choosing uh, two probes that are a little bit more spectrally separate, like 488 and 594, or 488 and 693, as in B and C, you can see you have less and less spectral overlap. Um, and so then if you look down at the actual images collected below of Alexafluor 488 and like a Psi 3, which I think is uh, fairly similar to the Alexafluor 555 um, emission spectrum, you can see in D by doing that simultaneous scanning, you get a lot of overlap. And those are obvious from the yellow pixels, where um, if you look at the two individual channels, A and B, um, you can see that the green and the red are actually in very separate locations, um, but when scanned simultaneously, it looks like they are in the same location as evidenced by those yellow pixels. Um, and so for something like that, you, you really do need to turn to um, scanning sequentially. Um, so sacrificing a bit of time in order to scan one laser and then the other laser um, so that you are only exciting your Alexafluor 488 and then only exciting your Psi 3 or Alexafluor 555 or whatever the case may be. Um, and so here um, I talk a little bit about you know the difference between uh, simultaneous scanning and like um, like a line sequential scan. So here you would excite your um, floors one laser at a time by line um, and then um, you would still collect with those multiple detectors, um, so you would still have those um, uh, those dichroics and those filters in place to help you separate those things. But by exciting them um, sequentially, you do a much better job, as you can see in image C that was scanned sequentially. Uh, there aren't any yellow pixels; they're all red pixels or green pixels. No, no none are. Um, uh, red and green in the same place, which would obviously visually look yellow. Um, other detectors, there are spectral detectors where you'll have like a maybe a 32 detector array um, and it splits the light uh, spectrally so that you're able to capture um, a full emission spectrum, um, which can be really, really nice, especially if you um, do want to do any sort of spectral unmixing. Um, so if you have two things that are very close together and you want to make sure that you are um, separating two fluorophores um, as optimally as possible, you can use a spectral detector um, and then use some fancy maths in order to be certain that things are being spectrally unmixed. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the advantages of confocal microscopy. I've talked about all of the components now as well as the light path. Um, so what are some advantages to doing confocal microscopy? Um, it removes that out-of-focus fluorescence from thick samples. It's got higher resolution even than the wide field technique. Um, you can use scanning and digital zooming in order to achieve your optimal pixel size. Um, and most systems have multiple detectors, so you can do simultaneous scanning um, if, you, if you really do need a bit, a bit more speed. Um, and then some limitations. So... Um, it requires a lot of signal. If you can't see with wide field, you're not going to see it with confocal. I have people tell me all the time, oh, it looks really dim, but I want to throw it on the confocal and see if I can, you know, get a nice image. And if it looks dim on the wide field, it's going to look real rubbish on the confocal. If you look down that eyepiece with wide field and you can't see much, you're not going to see much with confocal. Um, it's still typically limited to samples less than about 100 microns thick, um, and that's due to scattering. Um, you can do some like optical clearing techniques and things to help you be able to image deeper, but really confocal microscopy is kind of that, you know, maybe that 40 to 100 micron thick type range is is, is where, where you want to be. Um, you do still have to worry about photo bleaching out of focus planes because you are exciting fluorescence through that full excitation cone. You are just using that pinhole to eliminate the out of focus fluorescence. Um, so you still really have to worry about photo bleaching. And it's pretty slow. Even with resonant scanners, it's about 10 frames per second.